All right, hey everybody, Lowe Faber here, Dr. Lowe, and welcome to my new interview series, Conversations About Music with Musicians. And I'm having so much fun doing these interviews, and I'm real glad that you're here to watch them. I want to say, as always, uh, please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't done so already, and if you like this kind of content. And also, please check out my twice-weekly live streams I'm on every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m., every Thursday evening at 8 p.m., and those are Eastern times. And you can see the streams for free on YouTube and on Facebook. And please be sure to check out my guests' music as well. I'll be sure to post some links in the video description so you can check out their music beyond just what you hear in the interview. All right. Enjoy. Hey, man, how you doing? I'm good. I'm here. Um, here in the men's room, which is it's just neat. You know? Yeah, no, it's good that that's conveniently nearby for you, and just good acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> and you you are coming us to us from your home in Palo Alto, California. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, just outside Menlo Park. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Reed. I really appreciate it. My guest today is the fabulous Reed Jenauer. Uh, Reed uh, has a lot in common with me, actually, because both of us were uh, front man and singer for a 90s jam rock uh, band. Uh, Reed started Strange Folk with some friends in Burlington, Vermont, back in 1990-ish. Yeah, yeah, 91. Uh, and toured with Strange Folk and made records throughout the 90s uh, followed a very similar path to God Street Wine. Then uh, Reed went on to form the band Assembly of Dust in 2003. And most recently, he's released music just under your own name, Reed Jenauer. And Which, uh, I might have done sooner if my last name wasn't such a bear to pronounce, you know, I, I was afraid. <laughs> Am I pronouncing it right? You are, yeah. Okay. Or at least how i pronounce it but i pretty much answer to anything that's like remotely in that direction grenevere grenailer uh, it's it's a german word genau yeah uh well and and i should say that in addition to being a singer and songwriter and band leader and guitarist uh you're also a tech entrepreneur and software developer and you are also like me a dad and you you live in uh, California. And yeah, I think I think that uh, that's all we need to know about you for now. Uh, but we're going to talk about this. Then you want to know. <laughs> we're, we're gonna By the time we're about, done, we're going to talk about some of your your songs because uh, uh, you know I've been uh, really interested in songs for a long time. <laughs> Uh, yes, I and I find it so interesting, you know, every, every songwriter is just really a different, unique universe of, of creative approaches and concepts. And so, uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna listen to four of your songs and we're gonna go in, in chronological order, uh, going back to, uh, one of your strange folk songs. And uh, we're, let me just ask first, were you the, the sole songwriter in, in Strange Folk or did you collaborate or how did that work? No, uh, we, you know, I, we collaborated. And so, so it was Beatles-esque in a way. Like there were songs where each of us would bring it to the table and done. Right. And then primarily uh, I, I, I mean, John and I had started as a duo and we started almost right off the bat. I had one song. Uh, John Trafton. We, lead yeah, John, sorry. Yeah. Yep. And he had, uh, he had like, uh, you know, the outline of a song with no lyrics. And, um, and so, you know, one of our first ways we interacted is I, I wrote lyrics atop uh, that tune and, so it was a it was a mixed bag um, and better for it, I think, you know, because uh, more more, you know, I didn't always feel that way at the time. I have to be honest, but uh, looking back, just more genetic 
DNA, you know. When you started off with John as the duo, were you playing all, all originals from the beginning or were you doing like more cover stuff? Mm, you know, uh, it was a healthy, I would say still two thirds original, if not, you know, very quickly because I, I sort of just started playing music as a songwriter. What happened was I was, uh, I got into Shel Silverstein in fifth grade and I was writing like little Shel Silverstein like poems. Yeah. And then in seventh grade, I started, I learned how to play like G, D, and C. And I love the Beatles and I learned Let It Be. And I was like, that's G, D, and C. And I can write poems. So like, I just, that's, I started writing tunes like as that was my gateway to music. Yeah. Wow. How old, how, when, how old were you when you wrote your first song? Do you remember? However old you are in seventh grade. So 12. 12. Yeah. Yeah. 12 or 13. And I, I Bell Silverstein, old. by the way, also a great lyricist. A boy yeah, named Sue, right? <laughs> boy named Sue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and once you know it's him, it's like, oh my God. Of course. Right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I remember playing a boy named Sue for my, for my son when he was like nine and I wasn't sure what he would make of it, but when it was over, he was like, that was a great song. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's hard to argue with. I'll tell you what, I still get a little, uh, it's what I respect about him most is uh, his ability to be somebody else. But I get a little uncomfortable when John Pine sings, I am an old woman. And I played that, I cover that song and I'm always like, I have to smile, you know, to let the crowd know that yeah. I'm thinking about it or something. It's there's a there's a moment of discomfort for me. I, I, I'll confess. Yeah, yeah. I've never sung "Angel" from Montgomery. I mean, maybe it's, maybe that's why. That Such is a good tune. tune. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's like. Anyway. Anyway, let's listen to. Uh, the song called Elixir, which uh, Elixir is not from the lyric. The, lyri the, the lyrical hook is Weightless in Water, which <laughs> is also the title of the album from which the song comes. Uh, so you did a, you did a little switcheroo there. there. I think it was, you know, like almost like the intellectual equivalent of what fish does musically. They want to challenge people musically. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I didn't want to hand them the hand them the uh... throw them a little curveball. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you do that in your, your lyrics from time to time as well. But I, I, I tried to, before you play it, I got it. I got it. You know, this story, but one of there was a series. I mean, I knew, soon after you know probably uh, 15 16 that i was going to play music like no question white light and a black future that's a spot on the horizon and there were several informative moments many 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 but a couple that stick out one was seeing um <clears throat> blues traveler at wetlands you know at like 16 and being like and just i had never seen anything but arena rock like i didn't know there was that caliber music at that level and and then my freshman year at, at uvm you guys played in slade hall in the basement oh. and i was like holy cow i'm hey, doing you, that you were at that thing we did at slade hall yeah man oh wow like wow I, yeah um yeah. I, yeah I remember just being like blown away and i remember you played brick house so, which is testimony to hey you should play a cover give him something to hold on to but but i loved it man like i was blown away and oh, that was well, that was that was a moment where i was like well we're in a basement with like 150 people going nuts i'd be happy with this yeah God, and and i still would you know yeah yeah. Uh, I we we loved coming up to to Burlington. It was always such a fun scene, you know. Uh, we we knew that, of course, Fish was from there, and that a lot of the people who were enjoying this kind of music were were up there. And oddly enough, that's where Strange Folk, the duo, that same room, that's made our awesome. debut. John and I played an open mic, and we had those two songs. 
and you know, I'm being a little self congratulatory, but it, it's the truth. We played them and mostly people went up and we're like, kind of like, you know, playing country roads or whatever. And we played these two original songs and we would rehearse the hell out of them. And the place went ape shit. And that was another moment where like, I was like, Holy cow. We just yeah. like, we captivated an audience for the first time. So yeah. there's that room, uh, we cut, we mingled in there, man. And that was, I mean, that, uh, Bur the Burlington listeners, they were just so, so enthusiastic and supportive. They, they certainly were, I mean, it was a scene when I was there. That was part of the reason I went there. I, I was do, uh, driving around in an old Oldsmobile with my mom. We patched Church Street and there was a reggae band playing. I jumped out of the car. Like, <laughs> I didn't even let her park the car. I was like, I want to go here. <laughs> yeah. So, so you discovered the main point of college, which is to form a band and play music. Oh, that's the only reason I wanted to go. <laughs> right. And to ski and, you know, fornicate. Yeah. Well, let's, let's focus on the music now, Reed. Um, <laughs> rain it in, rain it in. I'm going to, I'm going to play uh, actually the video that I found for, for Elixir. Cool. Uh, if I can manage to share my screen. Okay. You see that? Yep. All right. Here we go. Weakness and water He came down the river Floated all the way Though his bones were shivering He had the sense to stay You can ride a horse 
Let's see. That's cool that you chose that one. There's, there's a story there. Well, uh, lay it on us. Well, it relates to the conversation that um, you and I have been having, which is that um, it struck me. Um, well, there's many things that struck me recently, but it kind of led to what I'm about to say. One is that um, there's just so much negative content in social media. It's, I sort of say, it's like the inane and the insane. It's a culture of inanity and insanity, the inane and the insane. And I don't really, I don't have any opposition to the, the inane. And, you know, I, I like a good, you know, f fart joke. Um, you know, the insanity I could do with less. And, and my observation is that part of it is, without getting into the whole thing, part of it is that there's a lack of media, a lack of, of sort of conversational video. And then being a musician, I, I went a level deeper and I was, it, I was looking at Spotify. And I was like, this is crazy. It's like going to Airbnb to rent a house and not seeing pictures of a house. Only this isn't a house. This is like sacred to me. So how is it I can see what every one of my friends had for lunch on Instagram, but there's no visual content, no visual, there's no face to music. And so um, as one of my other creative exploits, I've been working on how to solve that. And what you played was a test video made by a machine. Right. It, you know, I assumed that it was made by... Uh, it was the first one. Okay. The only thing I did was put it through that filter, which A, makes it look cooler, and B, hides the mistakes that the machine made. But it was just a test. And it, it worked. I mean, I, I forget how many views it has, but, you know, there are comments and stuff. And I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. Uh, well, so, I mean, yeah, and it's very simple, but it just really does serve to illustrate the lyric. Uh and it, it makes you think about the song in a new way. Yeah. I mean, uh, my vision is that it be truly expressive. That's like, you know, that's like, uh, I'm trying to think of the equivalent, you know, that's like the Cheeto versus the um, fourth course, four course meal, you know, that's just, sure. the, that's like the junk food, but, but, but Cheetos, it does, you know, have their place. They're, a, they're an excellent junk food. Uh, the cheetah what were the planners those round ball, uh, cheese balls that that was like a level up from the cheetah i'm not sure anyway yes the cheeto is a delicious food group uh so so uh you wrote this for strange folk the the band already existed yeah yep yeah. this is our second album weightless and water and, and uh, it's a great arrangement, by the way. I, 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 you know, songwriting aside, I think the four on the floor with a kick drum really propels. And then this tune must have just really kicked live with a good crowd. It did. It, I mean, four on the floor is kind of, it's an easy button to push. You know, I was listening to 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just gesture. And I, you know, I love it when it kicks in to the, to the uh, chorus. Um, it's a much more interesting, you know, and the diversity of the, you know, just the dynamics and the beat and everything. But I think, you know, in a lot of ways, my observation is that like without those amazing beats and four on the floor just happens to be a win every time, you know, yeah. all of Paul Simon's songs would have been ballads. Right. And so that's that song can be a ballad. It's like, right. It could be easily. And it's the beat. And I guess I don't know. It, it you know, it never can you play it a little bit like that. Wait, listen, water. Whoa, I'm tuned to half step low. I can tune up. No, I know. Wait, listen, <laughs> water. Whoa, he came down the river, right? And uh, I should tell our audience that uh, this tune is in uh, 
it's in F, it's in F minor, but Reed and Strange Folk do a strange thing where they tune their instruments a half step low. So you're playing in F sharp minor, and then the chorus is in E for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And and when did you start doing that? Did you do that from the very beginning? Yeah, I mean, the, there was a practical reason. There, I mean, it's fun facts that. Uh, uh, Guns and Roses and Jimi Hendrix both do it. Um, and I'm Stevie sure Ray Vaughan, to, like Ray Vaughan. All stuff, right? And I bet you it's the same reason, which was it, w when we started out, we were literally strange folk. John was playing an acoustic guitar with all sorts of, you know, with the same effect rack that he uses today. Not, not literally, but you know, the ghetto version. And uh, it's just, it was tough to get the dexterity on acoustic, acoustic guitar and mainly to bend a string up all the way up to the to the next note you know so it was easier to do with the guitar just a little more slack that was, oh, that was the reason yeah it was for the and bending then, yeah it was for the it was for the <laughs> i i thought you were gonna say it was because of you know the guitar strings sound they sound a little kind of thicker and fatter they do it's resonant yeah yeah but that was just uh that was heat to light. The real reason was so that it just giving him a little more dexterity. Uh, it, sometimes people have an answer for this and sometimes don't people don't, but you know, would, would you be able to answer if I asked you, what is this song about? It's one of the reasons I like this song is it's not specifically about anything. It's like a mood. And right. what was interesting is when I was trying to think about the, that, automated version and i was thinking about style i could i could name you know which is like i don't know a 70s singer songwriter sort of americana folk rock it's folk rock but the mood i'm like hmm it's a little bit love song it's a little bit dreamy it's a little bit americana and there's a loose story but it's more about like an ethos and a mood. And that's one of the reasons I, I like that song is there are moments and I don't know about you, but there are some songs that I have that are like fully autobiographical. There's some that I write out about their first person, but I write them in third person. And then there's some where I just like pop in for a minute and there's a minute of me, like a moment of truth and then I'm out. You know, and there's like, there's one, um, which was it? Um, Darkened Eyes and Fingers Since. And my wife has like almost black eyes and like really feminine long fingers. And, you know, we were getting deep into the dating uh, ritual. And that, so that line and her middle name is Lynn. So I said, my violin. So that's the one part that I am truly in on that song. And otherwise it's, it's just some, it's storytelling, you know, it's like wherever your mind goes. Did this one uh, change a lot from the writing to, you know, the band going out and playing it live? Yeah, that was, that was something that I, I think it was our greatest, Strange Folk's greatest weakness was our greatest strength and that is i don't mean this in a uh, derogatory way it's just the truth we learned how to play our instruments and how to be in a band together and so you know many guitar players who are re who really master their instrument can make a song sound like dire straits if the chord progression and the beat suggests it or if the, even the beat isn't there, just if the chord progression does and maybe the way the guy, the guy strum in it. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't. That, that was part of it. And then part of it is we were, you know, watching Fish closely and, and watching how much they challenged their audience. And it's not to say that we did. I mean, in any, or, or we did, but not in the way that they do. And particularly um, Luke, the drummer, just had a very non-conventional approach to drumming. And again, this is one of the things that I value in hindsight and found like painful in real time was it'd be like, Hey man, this sounds like a Dire street song or like a JJ Kale song. Let's say, you know, there's a beat, you know what it is. Right. Or like, it's kind of like lay down Sally and he wouldn't do it. He'd play something like that felt like far out. 
And it, it was almost jarring, I remember, oftentimes. And it's what made it interesting, right? Is that... It, it, I mean, and, we, could, we could talk for probably fill several videos just about the topic of working with drummers, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and given that neither of us were formally trained and had the language. So I was like, you know, four times. And he's like, four times what? You know, like, <laughs> you know, to me, it was obvious. It was four times around the chord progression, but he just <laughs> wasn't thinking about it that way. And, but, but ultimately it was that, um, yeah, they were, they were very, most times they were very different than what I imagined they would be. And uh, again, in hindsight, I'm glad for it. Um, within, you know, within, I was, I, I was always pushing for something upbeat because I don't know, I still kind of feel this way. Like I knew the ballads were in me, A. And it's just, I, I think like I heard an interview with Jackie Green talking about it. It's just easier to write a sad, yes. slow song. It just yeah. is. I, I agree. <laughs> and and they're, they work well. <laughs> it's much more of a challenge to, to to do the up-tempo stuff, it really is. And have it, you know, you can do it, but like, you know, think of funk bands. There are lots of great funk bands that are just, they're fabulous live, but there's no substance. The trick is like to have a, a song that's banging and that has like soul and substance. And it's just, it's, for, it's the blues, I guess. It's easier to do on, on that in D minor. <laughs> um the and to pull off you know positivity without being you know real pollyanna and and cheesy is is a real challenge <laughs> yeah i think one thing it is i agree um i think looking back at it for me intent is part having intent particularly as you get older because when I look at my catalog of songs, when like I, I wrote that in my twenties, and you just naturally are more optimistic, you know, you're imagining what will be, and yeah. your mind is like, you know, is like going to the four corners of the earth and beyond. <laughs> the world hasn't you, crushed you down. That's right, you know. And then you get older, and you're just like. <laughs> Liquor was strong and the hurt went wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm at a point where like, even if it's something sucky that's happening, I, I challenge myself, well, not always, but I, I, I do like to, to try and express it with some degree of optimism. And, you know, the distinction was, I read this in the last two years, the only distinction between optimism and pessimism i didn't read it actually it was at my kids like after school like i don't know uh, growth mindset class the guy was like the only difference is believing that something can change and not believing that's a static state and 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 so you can still see all the same problems but the but the optimist says the problems can be fixed and the pessimist says they can't they're permanent and there's actually a line in, in uh, 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 lecture that says, liquidate the solid state of order and of being and of everything you're seeing in your life. And I think that's what that song is about. It, it is a song about optimism. That's great. Uh, you, you did a project called Conspire to Smile. Yeah. That was 2018? Yep. And I mean, uh, I, I mean, I can't say I was all that familiar with with what you were doing with that, but it seemed to me that it was really a sort of, yeah, defiant manifesto of, of uh, positivity. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. I think if, if people, you know, if, if you Google me, let's say, or if you, if you inquire as to what I've done uh, with, you know, technology, it feels disparate, but to me, it's not. It's it's one contiguous uh, thought, uh, whatever stream. In that, I was 
you know, when that, when I set out to do that, my, the thought was like, I, I felt really like many of us have felt over the past several years, but this is when it kicked in just like degraded, depressed, and like kind of, de- you know, um, decapacitated. And I was like flipping out thinking like, I got to start working for a solar energy company. Maybe I should get into politics. Uh, you know, I got to go hide in a cabin and build a manifesto. And then I was like music. And so my, my, the, the thing that I set out to do was affect 500 people and, and encourage them to be 1% more positive against their own positivity ratio. Like you can be a, you can be an angry jaded cusp, but if you're one less, 1% less angry jaded, it's a big difference. And, and the metaphor is you leave New York Harbor towards Europe. One degree difference is Iceland. I mean, I should check it out sometime, but you know, anecdotally it's Iceland and Greenland and you know, and it's like, I'm sorry, and Greece. And so one's warm and sunny and they're they're topless women and one's dead Vikings and it's dark all year long. It's one, one degree difference. And that was, that was a premise. And the second was community that like, what's life all about? And, you know, I remember getting married. I was, I was, I was, you know, engaged and I was talking to a friend of mine who's already married and I was kind of like tweaked out, You, you know, you shut a huge door, you made a huge commitment. I was scared. And, and you, as I don't know, maybe not everybody, but you know, as a young man, I, half of all I did was like figure out how to chase women. And that was not going to be, you know, part of my life. And he was, I was, he, he dropped some wisdom on me. He was like, you know, life's about relationships, man. And, uh, and so in the context of feeling desperate, I was like, look, there are all these great relationships that we have and people, you know, do it implicitly. They rely on music, the the message in the music and then the community around it. And why not call it out explicitly? So that's what Conspire to Smile is. And it it continued, I continue to sort of riff on that idea uh, in my music and and beyond. Yeah, man. Um, The the bridge of, of Elixir has the se- sequence of lines that begin with you, like you can play the banjo out of tune. And to me, that sounds very kind of, uh, that feels good. You know, it's like, there's so many possibilities for you, you know? It was also talking about, um, I think, I don't know, actually, like, but just, I'm just riffing with you. I like the fact that it's also, it's talking about imperfections cool and that you know because that's another observation i have is that so so oftentimes we feel disappointed because the expectation's wrong not because the outcome's wrong yeah well it's a more kind thing to say to someone you can play the banjo out of tune it'll it'll be beautiful and and not (laughs) you're you're amazing, but you have to live up to this great standard, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, there's some movie that I can't remember. It's like, just came out and this guy dies. He's a musician and it's his thing and he dies. And like, you can only get reborn when you find your thing. And then like, I can't remember the name. It's, do you know it? Uh, you mean the new Pixar movie soul? Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the moral of the story is everyone's thing is just living like, and it's like, you don't need a special thing. You don't have to be, we have a culture that says you have to be the president of a, of an investment bank. You have to be the biggest rock star ever. You have to right. be the best X, Y, and Z. Right. You don't, you just have to smell the roses. <laughs> well, I mean, and even, you know, for me, what gets me off now about playing music is not the ambition part of it. It's really the the curiosity, you know, the the just exploring the possibilities, and also the 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 people part of it, right? The fact that it's not just me by myself. There's 
some there's other musicians sometimes and that's one kind of relationship and then there's an audience and that's that's another kind of relationship but we're having a relationship you know it's 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 going back and forth <laughs> yeah um okay well well um this is all great and and we've gone for a while just on the one song so so maybe i don't know if we'll I can't do like two hours. And I, don't want <laughs> I to. probably could. Yeah. But so maybe we'll do one more song and talk about that. And, you know, maybe we could schedule a, a part two. Sure. And, and uh, do the more recent stuff. I'm verbose, man. You can, you can shut me up. No, no, it's great. It's great. Don't, don't, don't uh, dial it back at all. But I really want to listen to the honest hour because this is a beautiful yeah. song. And uh, it's a beautiful song and, and vocal performance and band performance, I would say. And you've got uh, uh, some great musicians playing in Assembly of Dust. This was the original version. Uh, this was the original band. And so Nate Wilson really wrote that song. I mean, he wrote the music and you can hear it. They're piano changes. Right, you like they just are, and uh, oh, so you co-wrote this with him, with Nate, yeah. Okay. And my challenge to him, you know, his like Percy Hill sounds so much like not sound so much. I mean, they're heavily influenced by Percy uh, by um, Steely Dan, and and Nate's a you know has a, has a uh, I think he has a he's a master's in jazz piano, okay. and uh, I was like, write you know a country song as if Steely Dan did. And that's what yeah. came out of it. And so did he do the music first and you put lyrics to yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. So Nate and I, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I, th I think the two songs I'm most proud of are that one and Man With A Plan, which Nate wrote the, the, the music to as well. And I, I wrote the, the lyrics for him. Okay. Uh, it's well, like he made me smarter and I made him dumber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's listen to The Honest Hour. And I'm going to listen in Spotify. And this is from uh, the album also entitled The Honest Hour from 2003. <laughs> Beautiful uh, guitar work yeah. out there as well. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Adam Terrell. In the hour before the devil finds a guy. I'll move slow as my ending descends. Cause I couldn't stop from death She kindly stopped from me and she stole my breath If I'm bound or gagged, if I'm lost or losing I might want to leave from here Until then I'll still be cruising High above the atmosphere Walk through that hour in a drawn out sleepless bliss. Blinking possibility, shudder seems to exist. Like a prisoner of my personality, my time had come. My body was set free If I'm bound or gagged If I'm lost or losing I might want to leave from here Until then I'll still be cruising High above the atmosphere High above the atmosphere 
above the atmosphere Beautiful. I'm going to, I'm going to start playing this song. Cool. <laughs> I would be flattered. I, you know what I want to play? Once again, we're a, we're a, <laughs> we're a step yeah. down from where it's I lot, feel like we should be, but <laughs> it's a lot easier, you know, like, uh, often when I have, when I'm playing with a keyboard player that uh, a new, I'll uh, either tune, tune normally and then I use an app and I'll just modulate it so they just can learn them in the natural keys because it's so much easier. Um, and even for my kids, they want, you know, when they want to learn one of my tunes, that's what I do. I just put it in the, <laughs> in the yeah. normal key. And, well, and, sure, it's real natural in C. Yeah, yeah, but B is B is an amazing key, actually, and it's great for your voice. I I really was serious about this. I think this is a great vocal performance, uh, dude. This whole the whole album's live. There is no overdub, not a single overdub. Oh yeah, not one. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, that is was, amazing um, that your vocal. I mean, this is one thing I am working on in my vocal lessons is to 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 uh you know just just relax. And calm down. <laughs> and yeah, really it's funny. It, I, for me, it calms me, so I don't have to think about kind of like I go somewhere, and then just what come what you know that's a gift, I suppose. But whatever came out came out, you know. And and I, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel the effects of of age, but. I also listen to like some of my younger performances and while my voice is more, it has more body to it. I'm just like, you know, over singing and over performing and, and, you know, being in control of what you're doing, I think makes up for some of the lack of uh, almost like life, right. For some of the lack of uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> I mean, I think that there is from Elixir in 1996, which doesn't 
at all sound bad, but to this eight years later in 2004, there's a big uh, jump in maturity in, in your voice. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm talking about is like you, you trade youthful exuberance and, and like, like your body's just more nimble for, um, for wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so assembly of dust was more of a, project where you were you were the boss right <laughs> which is not the case in strange folk yeah benevolent dictator yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so and but you're hiring good musicians and giving them a, a lot of latitude and yeah and it was somewhere in the early days for the you know i think at our peak uh, musically we and and when we were performing the most it was somewhere in between because Nate and I were writing a lot of music together we were rehearsing and it happened really organically like these are guys who I'd all had who I'd had conversations over the years about doing stuff with and I'd kind of made a mental note you know like over x years like oh, yeah, yeah. and it just turned out that they all kind of lived in the same town and I spent a summer there and it happened really organically, but uh, it, it, it was more than, you know, definitely not hired guns. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I guess, you know, just logistically democracy in bands is, is uh, challenging. It, it really is. <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a great, uh, you know, system for our society, but, but in bands, it's problematic. <laughs> and it's, it's, there's so many levels too, because I don't know, I think Nate was, Nate was the musical director, right? So he was, he was calling a lot of shots creatively. John writes, John Moses writes the set list. Yeah. You know, which like, I would. I didn't trust anybody in Strange Folk to write this set list, but John, I'm just like, yeah, I hate writing set lists. So, I guess it's a long way of me saying, like, logistically and sort of like drive wise, vision wise, I was, you know, I was the the leader, but it was pretty pretty cooperative, you know, and and I didn't tell anybody what to play, you know, they played whatever the hell they wanted to. Um. Uh, did uh, did Assembly of Dust jam as much as yeah. Strange Folk? Yeah, not as much. Not as no. much. But we, that, I mean, there's 15 minute versions of songs and stuff. It just this, was... this song that the Honest Hour isn't isn't a particularly jammy. No song. There, uh, there's not a. We've never taken this one out. I. I. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's something you struggle with too. It's like, I think one of the reasons Elixir never. Well, first of all, I pulled the the fast one and didn't name it the name, right? If I had named it Weightless and Water, maybe it would have gotten more traction. But it, I think, part of the reason it didn't is our audience expected, you know, a guitar solo, and there wasn't one in sure. that one. Sure. Sure. Uh, I always, yeah, I would get very frustrated because sometimes the jam seemed to just grow and grow and take over the song and i'd be like hey people i wrote a song here <laughs> you know uh, and the jam is fine you know i i understand i think you know people think something about the jamming that it's that it's the focus whereas for me it's just the fact that we play live a lot and we don't want to play the songs over and over again the same way and we want to have fun and we want to mix it up but, you know, I think, you know, I've, I see like fish fans on social media and if they if fish doesn't jam enough, they, they literally have, have gamed out the proportion of fish's time spent jamming. And if it's not high enough a percentage, they're angry. <laughs> yeah. Or I've heard people say, you know, they played an X minute song, you know, version of song Y. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, the length of how long they played it is not a measure of good. Now, if it was interesting for 40 minutes, that is something else. But yeah. but I don't know. I feel torn. No, if any band can make it interesting for 40 minutes, Fish can. You know, they're they're good at that, but they're also good songwriters. They are. And I mean, you know, Trey thinks of himself as a composer, right? Yeah. 
Um, uh, okay, Not, uh, our fans would use the term blue ball version. Did you ever hear that one? Like they did a blue blue ball version. It was only four minutes long with no extended solo. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that, but uh, I I definitely know. They they feel like you're phoning it in, you know, if you don't. But I I can I can argue. I'm I'm stuck. I mean, I I love songwriting, and I I so respect the craft, not just my own, like really in other people and the the ability to c- convey like words um are finite but feelings and thoughts aren't you know and so the, the ability to express something beyond the words is you know magic but i was weaned on the teat of the grateful dead and i like hearing the interaction of of the band speaking to each other. And I like that feeling when it's happening. When what I can't stand is when it's jamming for the sake of jamming and nobody's listening. Like it shouldn't be jamming. We should call it something else. We should call it like listening. (laughs) You know, it's like, to me, read that the you know I love the the Grateful Dead albums, American Beauty and Working Man's Dead. Sure. Which, of course, everybody loves. But what I love about them is they feel the songs are very tight. You know, it's very song focused. But the sound, the texture of the band still feels improvisational, and you yep. still have the little noodles and stuff. And I hear that in your rendition of of this song too. Thanks. Now, everybody in the band, you hear you hear their noodles. You hear their looseness. Right. It's got that feel without yeah. being a 40 minute excursion. <laughs> this new record, Angels and Alibis, is that it, they're single takes. And I say yeah. I kept all my, you know, we did three takes and we chose the best one. And there's no vocal overdubs. They're one take. There's, you know, there's some it's almost 100 percent live in the studio. And it has that, you know, it's like a Neil Young uh, Harvest. It's like you can tell it's four guys sitting around in a room playing music together, you know, not some guy like making sure the one, you know, the snare is hitting exactly on the one every time with the Pro Tools. Yeah. Well, you know, I did actually, no kidding around, I did think of Harvest when I listened to the track. And I also thought of Dawes, you know, familiar with their recent albums? I know Dawes. I, you know, I, I, I thought there was a little bit of that same vibe. I like them. Yeah, they're a great band. I, I, you know, I haven't caught that. I guess I've seen them live more than I'd listen to them. And live, they're kind of show busy. So I should listen. Somewhere. I have never seen them live. He's a great, I forget his name, but the lead, lead guy is really charismatic. And so, I, you know, maybe lost it lost uh and it's different in life setting i'll listen but i i I love them i think they're a great band great songwriting uh well why don't why don't we listen to angels and alibis should i I play that one that's but do you want to you want to you want to play it yeah yeah sure okay that'd be great yeah Um, from reed's uh uh latest release it's just released as a single right it's not an album yeah, well, I've got an album coming, and it works. It's okay, much. It's kind of like it's like a Buffalo Springfield album, like yeah, you know, somewhere in there. Well, I, I urge everyone who's watching this video to to check out Reed's older music and his newest music. So, Angels and Alibis, the single is is out, and the full album is coming later this year. Yeah, it'll come later in the year. I. I I kind of got caught in the caught in the craziness, you know. I needed to breathe for a minute, and it's it's coming. But this song, uh, it's a it's it's a, apropos for the times. <clears throat> Let your imagination lay down and take a rest. I'll do my best to do the rest. Mm-hmm. 
You can only see the world but once or twice a week when angels and alibis are stepping on your feet. So let's make for the country, let's head for the coast. The boldness of bold fools is the road I travel most. Lately, I've been living crazy. Stammered stone, just plain lazy. Lady, maybe someday we'll play it straight. But let's just wait. There's a great and unsung army Flying green with a hummingbird Fighting for existence With the flight of every word And dreamers don't need deadlines Don't need jet airlines to fly When angels and alibis Are walking by their side so let's make for the country, let's head for the coast. The boldness of bold fools is the road I travel most. Lately I've been living crazy, stammered stone, just plain lazy. Maybe, maybe someday we'll play it straight, but let's just wait. So let's make for the country, let's head for the coast. The boldness of bold fools is the road I travel most. Lately I've been living crazy, stammered stone to just plain lazy. Lady, maybe someday we'll play it straight. Lady, maybe. Lady. Let your imagination lay down and take a rest. I'll do my best to do the rest. Mm -hmm. Lately I've been living crazy, stammered, stoned, or just plain lazy. Lady, maybe someday. Lady, maybe someday. Lady, maybe someday. The mansion has yeah man beautiful song thank you yeah well i'm so glad we got to hear you uh perform it live too yeah thanks for having me do that you mind if i ask you a question man uh no <laughs> so it was, you know, I, I'm a fan. And like, I felt starstruck when we met. And, you know, we had met once or twice on the road. And I told you that funny story about stealing all your stuff in the green room. And we opened for you one time. And I knew Bullethead well. And, and so, you know, our, our paths had crossed. But, you know, I would consider you a friend these days. But when we, not consider we are friends, but when. Well, I, you know, and I'm glad that uh, this, this crazy time that we've been living through has, has led to us, you know, talking from time to time. I really appreciate that. Likewise. Thanks for saying so. Yeah. But it was years into being a fan that I learned that most of the songs were yours and like, you know, and like Aaron delivers them, many of them like, they're his and they're yeah. so the question is for, that i have for you is like 
were there songs that you wrote and you were like, Hmm, I don't think I can do this one justice. Yeah. Or was it like you wrote them for Aaron? I just had, a, or both. I had a very, uh, very low opinion of myself as a singer. And I had said no confidence in my vocals. And so, uh, you know, I would have had Aaron sing every song if I could. Uh, you know, uh, but as it as it worked out, the practical way to do it was to give him the ones that were more sort of high and belty, and I concentrated on singing the ones that were more uh, rap or just kind of stayed down in the. Well, I got big ideas going through my head. You know, I'm down in that register. I'm comfortable. <laughs> um, well, and you you uh, you make it sound like it's a bad thing, but it, you you guys made a make a great. Um, pairing, you know, the, the harmonies are wonderful. And, and well, Aaron uh, had never sang before the band. Oh, my word. You know, he was, I, I, I got him to sing. <laughs> he played trumpet, you know, that's where his, his, uh, it's so funny. His I was just going to sound like, I was just going to say, he, he sings almost like a horn player, you know? Well, yeah, because, because trumpet players learn to support, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it, you know, it's fate. But it it worked. It was so cool. Did you write Diana? Is that your tune? Yeah. Yes, it that's is. that's one of my my favorites. He, he he sings it, and it's just like that's like a perfect song, man. It, it is a perfect song. That's a perfect song. In my mind, there's others. Oh. I, I I have to look at the song list, but that one, for whatever reason, has always captured me. Well, I don't know what to say. You're you're embarrassing me. <laughs> well, it's mutual ad admiration, and I just think it's fat, it's so cool because, you know, if you had asked me X years into it, I've been like, yeah, Aaron's the, you know, <laughs> it just, and that's something else too, right? You got to give him credit to take somebody else's song yeah. and deliver it with that conviction is, oh, uh, is yeah. a talent unto itself. All the credit in the world. I, I, I appreciate that guy so much <laughs> more and more as I get older, you know, because, because he had a, a tough job really. And they, <laughs> uh, he, I told him what to do a lot. <laughs> and, uh, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly mellow now, you know, you can tell I'm, I'm pretty easy going now, but 1%, back in the day, 1%, 1% man. <laughs> was, uh, you know, back in the day, I was, it was a different story. You know, I was pretty intense and sort of driven about it. And, you know, I don't really like myself back in my twenties and I certainly wouldn't have wanted to be Aaron working with me, but he, he managed it. So <laughs> uh, I think most of us, that's that was my point about um sort of being nimble versus uh wise you know you were you were being nimble and even though it felt rigid but nimble in a different way and uh i don't know i i i admire the uh the union <laughs> that's it's kind of what's magic about a band like strange folk or early god street wine is sort of like the limitations and that you are figuring it out and that there is a lot of shit that you don't know but you're just forging ahead and doing it anyway right yeah yeah and and uh i don't know like like twitter right it's a forging function that makes you do something and I, i've seen it in business where like where startups are about to go out of business and they find the thing because they have to focus and so in some ways like constraints are good you yeah. know um absolutely and you guys have something, you have a unique sound, which like having a voice as a band and as a player, that's hard to do, right? You can learn, you can, you can learn all the scales and all the theory and still not have a voice. That's, and it's so elusive as to, as to what makes up a voice, right? Cause it's a mixture of the, of the uh, technical, it's, it's just, and the, what's the word intuitive uh, uh, like ethereal you know yeah. yeah uh 
Well, I, you know, I think that we could really uh, do this for a long time. I don't, why don't we do another one of these again, <laughs> yeah. you know, a little bit down the road. That sounds great. Um, but I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, and you know, we have projects we're going to, we're going to work on some videos and maybe some songwriting. So, and, and, you know, knock on wood, maybe some playing live at some point. Yes. Well, let's, let's keep that. Let's pull that forward. Power of positive thinking, right? Absolutely. All right, well, man. Well, I appreciate it. It's a real pleasure, Reed. Yeah. Likewise, man. And uh, thanks, thanks for being so inquisitive and so um, thoughtful. Thank you for, for spending the time. Anytime, man. <laughs>